giving this presentation for you this evening in honor of Her Majesty's 95th birthday. I really love uh, royalty as well as British culture and history. And I know that many of you are more intrigued with the modern events, but we're going to take a look today at um, a lesser known period of Her Majesty's life. Her early years, we're going to talk about from birth to her coronation. We're going to answer a couple of questions today. Who or what made her the person she is today? And what made her so popular? Um, she's one of the world's most popular monarchs. And in this photo, she is wearing the Girls of Great Britain and Ireland tiara, the Queen Victoria pearl drop earrings. And she is also wearing the Nizam of Hyderabad necklace that was given to her as a wedding present, her sash, and Order of the Garter Medal. And she was born on April 21st, 1926. She was third in line to the throne. She was actually born at her maternal grandparents in London on 17 Bruton Street. And that's ironically now a Chinese restaurant. Now she is residing her first home, permanent home was 145 Piccadilly. Uh, she moved there around two years old. Uh, people often called it the palace without a name because people simply called it 145. And her parents went on tour so soon after her birth. And both sets of grandparents actually shared the place in 145 to take care of her when she was a little girl. And people were really fascinated to have a princess. Her uncle was unmarried, who was in line for the throne. Um, he had no children. Her aunt, um, Mary Princess Royal, had two sons, but they were really excited to see a princess. Winston Churchill says, she has an air of an authority and reflectiveness, astonishing in an infant. Churchill knew Elizabeth since she was a baby. He loved her and her parents. He would advise her later in life. They had a lot in common. Um, he was close with the entire royal family. He knew from the age of two, she was the age of two, that there was something really special about her. As Princess of York, she invented her own nickname, and that was Lilybet, because she could not say the name Elizabeth. She could only say Lilybet. So the whole family called her that and close friends, including the king and queen. Her education was supervised by her mother, who hired Marion Crawford, her governess, uh, for her education. And she also educated her sister, Margaret, who was born in 1929. Lilibet originally wanted to be married to a farmer because she loved animals. Um, so she said she always wanted to marry a farmer, and they always had dogs. Uh, she lived at the Royal Lodge, which was given to her parents as a country retreat in 1931. And it was around that time she met the first and only friend of her own, as her governess Crawfee said, and that was Sonia Grand Hodgson. She met her playing in Hamilton Gardens, and that was outside 145 Piccadilly. They had a lifelong friendship, and she was not a royal. You'll see that her riding bikes with Sonia in the picture I have on in the bottom left-hand corner, them and their governesses. She also went to the bath club for swimming lessons. And I have a few pictures of her and her parents. And we're going to talk a little about a, a bit about her parents here. They were King George VI. Um, in Elizabeth's early life, when she was princess, he was the Duke of York and called Bertie by his family members. 
He was also Prince Albert. His real name was Albert, not George. We'll talk about why he chose George as his name when he was king later. And her mother was Elizabeth, the queen mother when she retired from being queen. And she was originally Elizabeth Bowes Lyon and the Duchess of York. She actually is the queen consort when they came to the throne. Her two parents encouraged normalcy within limits. They encouraged Princess Elizabeth to play with her friends, um, to go to the bath club, to just be a normal teenager and young woman. But she couldn't really, even as a child, um, when they weren't in line for the throne because they were surrounded by aristocracy. And her father called the four of them, we four or us four. They were like a foursome and a unit. And the people loved that. They were fascinated by this family of four. They had never really seen such a close-knit unit before because a lot of times royal families weren't really very close with their parents or with their children. And eventually they were reluctant king and queen, her parents. They did not expect to become king and queen. They were not even in the queen mother's case wanting to be a duchess. She refused her, the Duke of York's proposal two times before she accepted because she was really concerned that she would never be able to be her own person within that type of environment. And here we have the quote, Elizabeth is my pride. Her father was always proud of her, even from a young age. She was always extremely hardworking, sometimes a little bit too serious, but she was very bright, uh, always eager to learn about anything, and a very dutiful child. And he, the end of the quote is, Margaret is my joy. Margaret always brought laughter to the family home. And we're going to talk about the king and queen, King George V um, here. He died in 1936, um, but he began the modernization of the monarchy. He actually founded the House of Windsor. He changed the name from Saxe Goburg and Gotha, which was too German. He realized after the First World War that there was a lot of anti-German sentiment, and so he decided to change the name of the house to Windsor. And he and his wife, Queen Mary, witnessed the women's right to vote, and the king gave out the first Christmas message, which is still a tradition to this very day. And they allowed their children uh, to marry who they wanted to. Before, people would marry other royals from, let's say, Germany or France, but they allowed their children to marry into other British families. And Queen Mary uh, was very interested in education. She loved history and geography. She took a specific interest in Princess Elizabeth's education. She was always a bit worried that there was not enough history and geography in the education. And she always spoke of that. She actually had an extensive jewelry collection um, she went all over the world to collect jewels. She often bought things, jewels, uh, designed her own jewelry. A lot of the jewelry in the royal family today that we see um, was acquired by her. And she bequeathed them upon her death to other members of the royal family. And she often even gave them to her ladies-in-waiting as well. She supported Princess Elizabeth's marriage to Prince Philip, which was not popular at the time. We will see a little bit about that later. And she took the princesses on outings to educate them. And Elizabeth actually called her grandfather, Grandpa England. And on a sad note, Queen Mary outlived three of her children out of six, so she outlived half of her children. And to the left, you see a picture of the king and queen at their silver jubilee. So after around 20 years on the throne, and you see Princess Elizabeth 
waving on the Buckingham Palace balcony and Princess Margaret peering over the balcony next to her. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Queen Mother's parents, Princess Elizabeth's grandparents. They were Claude Bowes Lyon, Lord Glamis. He was later the 14th Earl and 1st Earl of Strathmore and Klingorn. And her mother was Cecilia Cavendish Bentonick. And her lineage is very interesting. It actually traces back to the Tudor era on a few branches. One is to Mary Tudor, Queen of France, Henry VIII's younger sister. And the other side was to Mary Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife and Boleyn's sister. They were a very close family and they were loving towards the children and grandchildren. They were considered nobility, but they were still classified as commoners at this point. And even today, anyone outside the four point court of the royal family was still classified as a common. And to your right, we will see two pictures of the two happy couples here and a picture of Glam's castle. And it's interesting because Claude actually worked his own land. He was actually um, sometimes mistaken for someone who worked on the land. And he was made a Knight of the Grand Cross and Royal Victorian Order upon his daughter's marriage and was able to sit in the House of Lords. And the Earl and Countess were able to sit with Queen Mary at their children's coronation. So there's evidence that the two grandparents or the two couples got along very well. And next I'm gonna talk a little bit about King Edward VIII. A lot of you have heard of him. He would often come to play cards at 145 Piccadilly. He was known to David as, the, as part of the family, and they were originally very close with him, uh, the entire family. But the family never really forgave him for his abdication, and they felt like he forsook the family and duty for love which was uncomprehendable at the time. And it was just unforgivable, especially because they had devoted their whole lives towards the monarchy and organization. And Princess Elizabeth went through this at a very young age. She was 10 years old. She was determined to be different from this. She was determined to always be dutiful. She saw her parents and grandparents' reaction so this creates a whole very different relationship between her uncle and this whole entire family. And it just changed their lives so dramatically. He was initially extremely popular. He went with such ease with people. Elizabeth's father, uh, George VI, was just so afraid he could never measure up to that because he was extremely shy, he had the stutter, he just didn't think he could ever live up to the same expectations. It just wouldn't be easy for him. And we have the governesses and nursemaids, we have Marion Crawford, affectionately known as Croffy. She was governess for 17 years. She was not only a teacher, but a dear friend. She was there for the abdication when Elizabeth was becoming a teenager in World War II, and she was also at Elizabeth's wedding. Then we have Clara Alla Knight. She taught the queen to sit still for hours. She was very strict, just kept a schedule from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. She taught her to wave and to smile. She was actually employed by Queen Mary of Tech, which kind of explains the stick, uh, strictness because Mary of Tech was extremely strict as well. And now we have Margaret Bobo McDonald. And she was such a good friend to 
Elizabeth throughout her life. She was easygoing. This friendship lasted from when Elizabeth was a baby to the day that that Bobo died. And it was just later when she didn't need a nursemaid anymore, she became her Elizabeth's dresser. And she was able to call her Lilibet, which was such a high honor because almost no one outside the family was able to do so. And she is nicknamed Bobo because that was actually Elizabeth's first word. That is the rumor that she could not say Margaret or anything. She just said Bobo. And that might have been her first word. So to the right, we have a picture of Crawfee and Princesses Elizabeth and Princess Margaret up top. The middle picture is of Clara Knight and baby Elizabeth. And then at the bottom, we have Bobo McDonald and Elizabeth Sledding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about other family members, her aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends. So her maternal aunt and godmother was Mary Frances Buller Fuller Stone, and she married Sidney Elphinstone and became Lady Elphinstone. She was actually seated behind Elizabeth in the royal box at the coronation of Princess Elizabeth's parents. She was her mother's oldest sister. And actually, she is at the christening on the front left in the bottom right-hand photo. And her daughter was actually a cousin and dear friend, arguably Elizabeth's best friend, the Honorable Margaret Rhodes. She often did interviews and documentaries about Elizabeth, and she was a bridesmaid in her wedding. And she lived with Elizabeth at Windsor during the war. And she is on the bottom left-hand photo on the left-hand side. And next to her is Elizabeth Longman, and she was another member of the inner circle. She was a childhood friend of Elizabeth and another bridesmaid. Her dad happened to be a friend of King George V and a war commander and the Earl of Cavan. And then we have some siblings of Elizabeth's father, Prince George, Duke of Kent, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, they are in the top left-hand photo next to Queen Mary of Tech. And there was Mary Princess Royal, her father's sister, who is in the bottom right-hand corner on the right-hand side. And next we have Alethea Fitzalan Howard. And she is in the top right-hand corner. She spent the four years at Windsor Park. She was part of peerage through a Viscount and the Duke of Norfolk. And she kept a diary, which eventually was published. She talked about her experiences with Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. So right when Elizabeth is adjusting. Her beloved Grandpa England passes away. He had actually been ill for quite some time. He had fallen off a horse um, during World War I in 1915. He had chronic bronchitis and he battled septus in 1928 and 29, which is actually a really interesting part of Elizabeth's life because even as a toddler, she went to visit him and it got a lot of press attention. People were amazed to see this toddler going to visit her grandfather, and they were royals. So everybody wrote about it, and the public and the press were just really impressed. And during that time, his son Edward did many of his duties, and he eventually got worse in December of 1935 especially after the death of his sister, Victoria, and he died in late January. 
He was buried on the 28th. And then there was a secession crisis um, because Edward VIII becomes king, but he wants to marry Wallace Simpson, but he cannot do that and become king because she is twice divorced. And the Church of England doesn't even recognize the divorce at all. So his advisor, Alec Harding, and Prime Minister Stanley, Stanley Baldwin explained that this would just not be acceptable. The public just won't accept this. And unlike present day, where the press just jumps on everything um, that happens in the royal family, the opposite happens here. The press just did not report on this at all until it almost came to the abdication. On pressure and advice from the five dominions, Edward advocates because that's the only way he can have this marriage is to not be king. Funnily enough, his support never really wavered um, by the public, but it was very much parliament that was mixed on the issue. His parents were also dismayed, just absolutely dismayed. His father, George V, went running to his press secretary saying, that woman in my home, just when he was seeing her and invited her to the palace, he was so horrified. And um, Queen Mary of Tech just really hoped that he would get over it, but he did not. And when he abdicated, she has this quote that said, oh, all this, he gave up all this for that, and they just couldn't understand it all. But by default, you get a new king, even though the public was listening on the radio to this abdication speech and just like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, his brother, you know, Albert becomes king, and he takes the, the name George VI to honor his father. And an interesting other point is that he and his father were both second sons. They were both the spare that ended up becoming king, one because the older brother died and this time because of the advocation. And he just did not feel at all prepared. He was weak as a child. He stuttered. He had knocked knees and more painful splints. And he was very much a Navy man. He liked the military. He liked the small gatherings. It was the case that somebody actually wanted to be the spare, but he had to immediately learn what his brother had prepared for his whole life. So they just were very reluctant to do this, but they knew what their duty was, and they went ahead with it and became king and queen. The coronation took place on May 12, 1937, it was actually the same exact day that his brother was supposed to be coronated. They didn't change the date at all. And Princess Elizabeth becomes heir apparent. She was never Princess of Wales. And an interesting part of why that is was because she was a girl. And her parents were still young. They still hoped that, uh, people still hoped that her parents would have another child and it would be a boy and he would become the Prince of Wales. Obviously that did not occur. And even later in life when it was obvious that that was not gonna happen, they just never gave her the title. They never changed what had already been done and set in stone. And Queen Mary threw her, her whole heart and soul in just um, helping her second son become king. The royal family and the monarchy was the most important part of her life, and she continued to do her duty no matter who was on the throne. And around the time of the coronation, Princess Margaret asked Princess Elizabeth, does that mean you'll one day be queen? And Elizabeth goes, yeah, I, I suppose. And Margaret goes, for you, but Elizabeth never complained at all publicly about having to be queen. 
And George V actually, by amazingly, which we never expected, got exactly what he wanted. He said, after I am dead, the boy will ruin himself in 12 months about his son, you know, Edward VIII. And I pray, God, that my eldest son will never marry and that nothing will come between Bertie and Lilibet and the throne. And Elizabeth is uh, entrusted with royal duties right away. Her father asks her to watch his coronation and take notes to prepare for her own, and she does. There's a paper that she wrote that the British monarchy still is in possession of and has that says, to mommy and papa, in memory of their coronation by Lilibet, by herself. And the coronation was filmed, but not released on television right away, but it was followed on the radio. And uh, he gives her responsibilities during the war, but remains protective of her as a loving father. He really enjoyed the relationship with their children, his children. He was not very close to parent, his parents for much of his life. He got a lot closer to them after princesses Elizabeth and Margaret were born. So he is a very protective father. But the princess was very dedicated to learning about matters of state. She was educated in constitutional affairs and state by Henry Martin, which she much enjoyed, and French by native speakers. And when they moved to Buckingham, it was a little bit difficult for her. She was worried in particular about how her horse, Ben, would deal with the move, a play rocking horse. Or, and she asked Sonia to bring him over. Um, he would not like being in a box. So after she moves to Buckingham, a couple weeks later, she asked Sonia to bring him over. And for her parents wanting to create some normalcy and friendships for the princesses, they create the first Buckingham Palace Company uh, with the Girl Guides. Princess, the Princess Royal was an honorary pre president. Uh, this is much like brownies or Girl Scouts. They learned how to tie knots. They learned about fires and a lot of things with nature. But it was a very carefully crafted group of girls. It was almost all nobility and royalty. So it does not really achieve the normalcy that we would want or expect. But it did give her friendships. And she did have friends in the group. And eventually, she became a sea ranger. So right when she's getting adjusted to being heir apparent in 1936, everything starts changing again in 1939. So he's, we're starting to see World War II, and it breaks out. The royal family was, it was suggested that they evacuate. Um, they did not, and the queen mother will tell you why. The children won't go without me. I won't leave the king, and the king will never leave. So the princesses were shuffled around from palace to palace until they decided safest at Windsor Castle, and the king and queen stay at Buckingham. And Buckingham was terribly bombed a number of times, and sometimes that was while the king and queen were in residence, and barely escaped with their lives. But the Queen Mother said, I'm glad we were bombed. We can now look East End in the face because East End had been so horribly bombed and suffered the most in London. She just felt so bad and she wanted to share that suffering with her people. Another thing that was tragic during the war was 145 Piccadilly was destroyed on October 7th, 1940. They eventually rebuilt it as the Internet, Intercontinental Hotel. These pictures here are events that happened in 1939. Queen Mary got her wish of teaching the princesses about history and culture. She took them to museums and to the London Zoo. 
which you see in the right hand photo here, the zoo is getting ready to protect the animals, you know, from the war. And here is giant panda Ming, um, one of the first pandas of the Chinese conservation program for giant pandas. And she is here visiting from China, and she is sniffing a dog. Princess Elizabeth and Margaret are looking at her and the dog. And another thing that happens is uh, Prince Philip graduates from cadet training in the Royal Navy at Britannia Royal Navy College at Dartmouth. And Elizabeth and her parents, as well as her sister Margaret and Crawfee, go to see him graduate. And her, his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, first Earl of Burma, and her mother ask him to give her and Margaret a tour. And she falls in love with him at 13 years old. And she is determined to marry him ever since. It was not their first meeting. It was the second, but this was the meeting that she fell in love with him at. And she remarked to Crawfee about how high he was jumping and how fascinated she was. And the princesses are often used as a propaganda strategy um, during the war. There was the BBC Children's Hour. It was her first public speech. She shares sympathy with others living away from their homes. The princesses were at a secret location. We have not forgotten you. We send our best. And Margaret joins in at that news hour in 1940 to say good night. And to you and your host families, as most children were living with host families at that point, living away from parents in the countryside. They say peace will come and the world will be a better place. And the king, George VI, echoes sadness over broken families, but assures peace and unity will come as well as happier days. And that is over Christmas. And her mother also thanked host families uh, for taking in children during the war. Picture to the right is right before mother and daughter were separated. And throughout the war, Elizabeth really wants to help in the war effort. And she put on her own Christmas pantos from 1941 through 1944 with the help of her sister, Margaret. They starred in a concert with kids from the Royal School to raise money for the Royal Household Wool Fund. And this money that they raised provided comfort for troops. It was Margaret's idea, and the palace asked for their head, Hubert Tanner, to help them do Cinderella and others. And it was a series of plays. Actually, Prince Philip comes to Aladdin. Uh, she was running to Crawfee and saying, guess who's coming to see us act? She was so excited, and it was one of the most exciting parts of the war for her. The princess also awarded a prize to a Welsh school child on the subject of metal salvage. And she also participated in the Dig for Victory campaign. People were creating their own gardens of vegetables and fruits because of rationing. She created her own at uh, Windsor Castle. She was filmed doing her victory garden. So at the age of 16, she has her first solo public engagement. And that is when she spent a day with the Grenadier Guards Tank Battalion in Southern Command. Um, she took over from her second great uncle, the Duke of Conneaut, who had just passed away. The officers gave her a diamond brooch of the day before the engagement. And you'll see towards the end of the war, she's really starting to step up her role. She became one of five counselors in, in state for her father. In case he becomes sick or incapacitated, um, she would be able to make decisions and help with our royal decisions. 
There were American soldiers stationed in London, but her mother is concerned about her children meeting soldiers. She's experienced death in war firsthand. One of her brothers died in World War I. And actually, George VI's brother, uh, George Duke of Kent, dies in an RAF mission in 1942. No one really knows exactly what happened. The plane crashed in Scotland, but he had uh, Swedish Kronas on him. And the papers about the accident went mysteriously missing. So nobody really knows what went on, and there are some theories on it, but we'll never really know for sure. And Prince Philip continues visiting much more and more during the war, and this is when their relationship really starts blossoming. And at age 18, she's starting to visit with her parents. She comes to see the Rose of York B-17 plane, and the people that are flying it. Her father is much of a traditionalist, and he really didn't want her participating in the war. Um, he wanted to protect her, but she was determined to serve in the war. And she applied for the labor exchange. She got an interview. Um, she was not chosen, but she does not stop there. She applies for the auxiliary territorial services, and she was accepted. And she's still the only female to ever serve in the military. And she was very well ranked. She became a junior commander and she wanted to be treated normally, um, but it was impossible. There was all kinds of press intrusion, unfortunately, but she was able to be a truck driver and a mechanic. And she was able to drive ambulance uh, trucks and take care of them. She was able to be a mechanic. She was allowed to talk to other cadets with supervision, but she was not allowed to stay overnight. Each day she was driven back to the castle or she drove herself back to the castle, um, but she could not, not stay overnight like the other royals or other cadets and she shared everything I learned was brand new to me all the oddities of inside a car and all the intricacies of map reading um, it was just very fascinating to her she showed her mother what she was doing and she was map reading she really gave a contribution to the war effort and most of this was in 1945 at the tail end of the war now we're gonna talk about victory in Europe. We finally won, they finally won, and there were huge crowds outside Buckingham. And they were clapping and screaming for the king and the royal family. And they came out a no number of times on Buckingham Palace. They waved to the people and the people sang to them. And later Churchill, um, Prime Minister William Churchill comes to signal the letter V here he is in the photo. And Princess Margaret suggested she and Elizabeth mingle with the crowds and, you know, just have the experience. And the king and queen said, that's okay. Yeah, we'll let you do it. Special occasion. But they were shocked when they saw what London looked like. They had not seen the damage that the city had obtained um, from Windsor Castle. It was a very different environment. They, they were just so sad how London looked, but they danced with the people, they linked arms with them. It was a very memorable experience. And I just wanna point out how differently the king and queen looked at the war versus Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson, Duke and Duchess of Windsor. The king and queen were extremely dedicated to the British cause and the allies. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor met with Hitler before the war. We're not sure they met during the war, but there's documents stating that they were, they had pro-German sentiment, which the Duke vehemently denied, but the evidence shows that they may have been sympathizing the other way. We are not sure. And King George VI says, poor 
darlings. They have not had any fun. He was actually very sad after the war that his daughters went through that because it was their teenage years and he feels like they weren't able to meet people. They weren't able to live the way they should have been able to. And Elizabeth did have fun. That quote is actually not true at all. Um, she loved her blossoming, blossoming relationship with Philip. She did not mind the war at all. And many of her friends say that she really enjoyed that time in her life. And following the war, she finally got adult clothing. <laughs> um, her parents finally let her grow out of children's clothes. Um, and they got her a designer, Norman Hartnell. She had her own meeting office, telephone, and she was able to do her own charities in her own little office area. And uh, she becomes the face of hope for the people. They see her father as aging, so they see her as the next heir. They're very excited about that. And Prince Philip uh, returns in 1946. He actually saw the armistice signed in Tokyo Bay. He also served in the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. He's a lieutenant during the war in the Navy. And there was a lot of opposition to the engagement and prospect of them marrying. The family didn't really want her to marry someone with German heritage and links because they worked so hard to rule out that German part of their family. And it was still very close to the war. And Prince Philip's sisters had Nazi links. Uh, they all married German husbands, and many of them did serve with the Axis powers, which is a little bit ironic because his mother was actually hiding a Jewish family during the war. But, you know, that's war. Families do different things um, or on different sides sometimes. There were concerns about his personality because he was outspoken and did not wear a suit. And the papers really wanted her to marry someone else. They just were not enthusiastic about the marriage at all. But people say she was only 19. She can still meet somebody else. People were absolutely obsessed with the couple. They could not go on any dates or outings or royal duties normally because people were just obsessed with them and running them down and yelling at them about their relationship and asking them all kinds of questions. And his family was exiled from Greece and there was ex unrest in the country. And at one point his mom had been institutionalized, Princess Alice. So there were a lot of things just about the family that were going against his cause. He grew up with his grandmother, uh, Victoria of Hesse and Rhine, and his uncles, George and uh, Louis Mountbatten. In 1946, he becomes a naturalized British citizen, and he converted to the Anglican faith, Church of England. And I'm just going to go over a couple of other suitors. She never took any of them seriously, though two of them were very close friends of hers. Elizabeth would not consider anybody else, but there were also very few other options because she was very sheltered in the environment that she grew up in. One of these was Henry Herbert, later the seventh Earl of Carvin, Lord Porchester. He was actually inherited and owner of the castle, Highclere Castle, which is where Downton Abbey is filmed. There was Hugh Fitzroy, Lord Ooston, 11th Duke of Grafton. There was Charles Manners, 10th Duke of Rutland, and Patrick Plunkett, 7th Baron Plunkett, who became one of her best friends. And you see those pictures to the left of Henry Herbert and Patrick Plunkett. So in South Africa in 1947, uh, the royal family did a whole tour. Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth were practically engaged by this point. 
but the parents were still unsure. They wanted to see if the two were still interested in marriage after this tour, which was going to be a couple months. It was from February to April, and it was the first state visit since 1939. They traveled over there by the HMS Vanguard and by train, and it was an attempt to be closer to the British dominions. Elizabeth received a gift of a large diamond necklace. And it was a very political time there. There were national party boycotts. The king was not allowed to shake hands with African servicemen. It was just a whole very intense political dynamic at this time. And she actually celebrated her 21st birthday in South Africa. She gave a very important speech about her declaring her commitment. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. And it's finally announced in July 9th, 1947, that Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth are engaged. And people sent presents from all around the world. And they were just fascinated and so excited that there was going to be a royal wedding because it was the first real major event after the war. The prince gave her a ring from diamonds from his mother, Alice's tiara, and people sent letters and presents from all over the world. And there were diamonds left over from the tiara that weren't used in the ring. So he designed an Art Deco geometric bracelet for her as well. I'm just going to go over a little bit about how the two are related. They're third cousins through Queen Victoria. And their second cousins once removed through King Christian IX of Denmark. And these relationships will go back to the 1800s, uh, 19th century, with the Victorian era. And finally, we get to the wedding. It was November 20th, 1947. It's actually the 10th uh, wedding in the royal family to be at Westminster Abbey. And she paid for her dress with rationing coupons. They got a little help of 200 rationing coupons from the government, but that was all. She paid for the rest of it herself. The, the dress was done by Norman Hartnell. And it was ivory silk with thousands of seed pearls imported from the United States. The train was 13 feet in length. And it was inspired by Botticelli's Primavera. And her tiara was the Queen Mary fringe tiara. And it could also be translated into a necklace. It almost broke before the ceremony when the Queen Mother says, we have two hours and many other tiaras. But they did have someone on hand to fix it. There was myrtle in her bouquet. It was broadcast on BBC radio. And highlights were televised later that day. It was not the first wedding to be televised live. And Prince Philip got new titles on his marriage. Uh, that was when he got his Duke of Edinburgh title, um, the Earl of Marianif, and Baron Greenwich. And there were a number of people that were not able to come, whether they were not invited or just didn't end up coming. The Duke of Windsor was not invited, and therefore his sister, Mary Princess Royal, faked illness, we think. She says she was ill. A lot of people don't believe that because she was extremely close with her other brother, and Prince Philip's sisters were not invited because of their ties to Germany, And but his mother was there. Here are some photos of the wedding. Princess Elizabeth had eight bridesmaids, the HRH Princess Margaret, HRH Princess Alexandra of Kent, Lady Caroline Montague Douglas Scott, Lady Mary Cambridge, the Honorable Pamela Mountbatten, the Honorable Margaret Elphinstone, 
Lady Elizabeth Lambert and Diana Bowes Lyon. Um, if you've seen The Crown, the two sisters that were institutionalized because of developmental disabilities, uh, Diana Bowes Lyon is their sister. And Philip's best man was his cousin, David Mountbatten, Marquess of Milford Haven. The page boys were William, Prince William, Duke of Gloucester, and Prince Michael of Kent. And let's see, I have a clip here from the wedding. And her father wrote her a note after the wedding. It says, I was so proud and thrilled at having you so close to me on our long walk in Westminster Abbey. But when I handed your hand to the Archbishop, I felt I had lost something very precious. You were so calm and composed during the service and said your words with such conviction that I knew everything was all right. And here are her parents, king and queen, at the wedding. And in the back, Queen Mary of Tech and Princess Alice, uh, Philip's mother. And the honeymoon was at Broadlands at Louis Mountbatten's home, uh, the first Earl of Burma. And there were crowds and mobs all over the place. It was really not private at all. So they went to Burke Hall. It was more private. And she had her dogs there. So she really did enjoy that part of the honeymoon, which was three weeks long. And in this photo, you see her sapphire chrysanthemum brooch, which she still wears often. And after the honeymoon, they moved to Clarence House. In 1948, the king is seen as ill. People are viewing Princess Elizabeth more than ever as their heir. The wedding made them extremely popular and they were asked to go to Paris by Secretary Jacques Colville and they had extra security there due to kidnapping plots and pregnancy reports. She was actually four months pregnant. So President Vincent Oriol gave Elizabeth, the Grand Day Cross of Legion and Honor, and Philip with Crow de Guerre with Palm. And she actually opened the Galleria Museum. She did her whole speech in French, and she gave this for the opening of the Exhibit of Centuries of British Life. And the king is going through a lot of difficult times at this point. He's having uh, blood clots. Politics was very difficult for him. He was very nervous and depressed and worried that the other politicians and secretaries were leaving him out. 
And Crafty is also leaving the household around this time. And she gets married. Um, so that is another change as well. And November 14th, 1948, Prince Charles is born. She gave birth at Buckingham Palace and he was not automatically going to receive a title. So King George VI sent the papers and letters to the patent. Elizabeth was in labor for 30 hours. Uh, she eventually had cesarean section and Philip rushed home upon hearing the news. It was the first royal birth without a home secretary. So she was breaking that tradition there. And the King's Royal Troop Artillery fired a 41 gun salute and bells at Westminster Abbey. She let the palace staff see the baby and he was christened on December 5th. And the King is diagnosed with a number of ailments around 1949 to 1951. He has Berger's disease, uh, disease and he had a lumbar symptomy to get rid of an artery blockage in his leg, and he will eventually lose his left lung. Philip is stationed in Malta, and they're living in Malta. It's one of the happiest moments of her life. She gets to live as a normal Navy wife here. Unfortunately, that doesn't last long since the king is ill. And Princess Anne is born in August 15th, 1950. She was born at Clarence House. And this is when Martin Charteris was appointed to her private secretary. And he is a permanent fixture for much of her life. Crawfee also came out with a book this year. It is called The Little Princesses. Uh, the royal family was shocked and very upset about this. They thought that she was profiting off her um, connection to the royal family, and they really did not speak to her again after the book came out. So we have the tour of North America from October to November in 1951, and it was Princess Elizabeth's first solo tour. And she stood in for the king who was originally supposed to go as he was ill. And the tour was actually delayed because the king had to have surgery and get his left lung removed. And there was a row between CBC and BBC who was going to cover the tour. BBC really wanted uh, British inputs and accents actually at the, the news. So... Uh, they really wanted to do the news coverage, but CBC said it's our country, really, we really want to do the coverage. They actually arrived by plane, and this is the most covered tour in Canadian history. And with security, people must be 30 feet from the princess and prince. Thousands of people turned out to greet them, and they went all over Canada. Um, cities tried to really outdo each other. She met Prime Minister Louis St. Laurent and visits Harry Truman, president at the Canadian Embassy in DC. And when she went, met President Truman, she wore the Great Britain and Ireland tiara. She wore her sash and Royal of the Garter and the Nyazam necklace. It was a 30 plus day trip and they carried a draft a session record in case her father were to die while she was away. So then we have the tour of Kenya. And it was really also supposed to include Australia and New Zealand, but it did not end up doing that. King George VI goes to Heathrow Airport to say goodbye to the princess. Um, doctors really didn't want him to go at all. They advised against this, but he goes anyway. She arrives in Kenya and went to Nairobi and then on a safari and she saw Aberdare National Park. And that night she sleeps in Treetops Hotel, 20 meters off the ground. It was a very memorable experience. And it was at that moment that she, that night that the king passes away. 
and being so far away, they did not know. So she is given the news at Sagana Lodge. Um, Prince Philip is told immediately when they arrive back at the lodge, and the lodge was actually given as a wedding present. And Prince Philip chooses to tell her on a walk in the gardens. She immediately apologizes for having to end tour. And it's just so amazing that she apologizes when her father just dies. And it's like how one of her lady in waiting says it. It's she goes into the treetops to the hotel as a princess and she just comes down a queen. And she flies home to London as a queen. So here are some photos of her arriving home. The king really is mourned by the nation, but they are really accepting of their new queen. And she was flying back. It says in this newspaper right here, um, she's wearing black in her mourning clothes. She is only 25 years old. It's, it just seems like so much for a 25 year old. And her press secretary of many years, Dickie Arbiter, always reminds people that it's not a day for celebration. She has always made it clear that her long reign is a consequence of her father's early death. And so it is not a day for celebration. She will go to church the day before and her father will be in her thoughts then. On the day itself, she will do her red boxes but she won't be going out and about anywhere. So she always remembers the day she lost her father. And the first order of business was when Martin Charteris asked her what she wants her name to be as queen. And she says, Elizabeth, of course. And she keeps the name House of Windsor. Prince Philip was very upset about keeping the name House of Windsor. He really wanted either the House of Edinburgh or House Mountbatten, but Queen Mary was very influential in this decision as well. She really wanted to keep House of Windsor, and Elizabeth agreed with her. Philip felt very slighted, like he couldn't name his own family or house, um, and she didn't take his name into consideration. But the proclamation of the session went out all over the country and the world, and unfortunately for her and Prince Philip, that's kind of a tense situation for a very long time after that until she names her heirs from the 1960s uh, last names, um, Mountbatten-Windsor. Then it's her father's funeral. On February 11th, they moved him from Sandringham in Northwark to Westminster Hall. Over 300,000 people came to Westminster Hall to pay their respects. The Duke of Windsor arrives on the Queen Mary boat. Uh, he found out in the news, not by the palace. So he is bringing his grievances across the pond with him. And then the Duchess of Windsor, who was not there, thought that the Duke would not be allowed to walk in uniform behind the coffin in the procession. Um, so she's very uptight on the phone, but he was, he was allowed to walk in the procession. And Big Ben told 56 times and 56 guns were fired for every year of the king's life. And Queen Mary made a brief appearance at the funeral, um, but she did not watch the procession in public. She watched it from her window. She was still very grief -sicken, uh, stricken. She whispered, there he goes, as uh, she watched the coffin pass by her window. The government sent white lilacs and carnations in the shape of the George's cross, and it was signed by Winston Churchill for gallantry. And his coffin was draped in the royal standard with the imperial crown, scepter, and orb. And now Queen Elizabeth goes on her first state opening of Parliament. Um, there are so many crowds to see the new queen. People are really excited to see her do her first state opening of Parliament. 
And the procession is from the Irish state coach from Buckingham to Westminster. She is wearing the King George IV, uh, the fourth tiara, the Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee necklace, the Order of the Garter, and the Yege Lou Couture Caliber 101 watch, which is a favorite of hers over the year. And it was her first major state event. She honored her late father in the beginning of the speech and she was in a special parliamentary robe. And then she, Prince Philip, Prince Charles and Princess Anne wave on Buckingham Palace balcony afterward. Right before her coronation was the death and funeral of her grandmother, Queen Mary. She died on March 24th, 1953 she asks before her death for the coronation to go on without her. And she had been ill for some time. She never really recovered from losing her sons. And Winston Churchill is in the middle of a important vote at Parliament. And after the vote, he, uh, he announces the death. And she was mourned by numerous people. She was a very long-term fixture in that family and in um, royal life. And she is buried in St. George's Chapel in Windsor. And we're finally at the coronation. It rained on coronation day, but people still threw parties. Uh, people were still camping out to get a glimpse of the event. And they found out that the uh, Coronation was going to be on TV, and TV sales skyrocketed. There was a controversy between the Queen and Cabinet and Parliament on whether it was going to be on TV or not, but it ended up being televised, and it began at 11 a.m. And it was interesting because there were a lot of unexpected problems um, with the Coronation at first. She had trouble with the carpet at the Abbey. Her robes were having trouble gliding over the carpet. And they were actually out of the holy oil that they needed. It had been destroyed in World War II. And luckily, an elderly relative had some they were able to loan uh, for the event. She had a gown also created by Norman Hartnell with the emblems of the UK and Commonwealth in gold and silver, along with Indian lotus. It was made of silk, and she had her robe of state with white linen and crimson velvet mantle and gold lace embroidery. And on her way to the coronation, she wore George IV's crown, but switched to St. Edward's crown at the coronation. And she held the orb. It's a gold globe with diamonds and sapphire. It also has pearls and amethyst. And she wore the wedding ring of England. She also had the coronation necklace and earrings. After the event, she traveled back to Buckingham Palace. She had six maids of honor and one mistress of the robes assist her with her train at Westminster Abbey. They were Lady Moira Hamilton, Lady Rosemary Spencer Churchill, Lady Anne Coke, Lady Jane Heathcote Drummond Willoughby, Lady Jane Van Tempris Stewart, Lady Mary Bailey Hamilton, and the Mistress of the Robes, which is the Dowager Duchess of Devonshire. Here's a clip of the coronation.
Prime Minister Clement Attlee says, let us hope we are witnessing the beginning of a new Elizabethan age, no less renowned than the first. And I just want to make a few points. She was heavily influenced by family values. She always kept the people in mind. And people were really excited to have her on the throne. And she continued the modernization of the monarchy. And you can see her with her predecessor, Elizabeth I, up there. They had a lot of parallels, both rising to the throne at uh, 25 years of age. And they were both very far down from the line of secession. And here are my sources. And I have a few books up here that you might be interested in. Some of them are brand new, like Elizabeth and Margaret, The Intimate World of the Windsor Sisters. And there is Daughter of an Empire, My Life as a Mountbatten um, by ha Pamela Hicks. The Final Curtsy by Margaret Rhodes. And Lady in Waiting, My Extraordinary Life in the Shadow of the Crown by Anne Glenn Connor and The Windsor Diaries. Uh, my Childhood with the Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret by Alathia Fitzalan Howard. Here's some more pictures here. And that is all. I'll see you at another time soon.